Testing? Okay. Um, yeah, so more about me. My name's Kara. Um, this is Steven, my husband, and we own Steed Interactive, um, which we've been doing for about the last three years, a little over three years now. And basically, we went, like, we jumped in feet first. Um, I think Steven, ha Steven has been doing uh, code stuff for about 10 years prior to this at um, Oklahoma Christian um, as their web development director. And then um, moved short time to an agency that uh, doing web stuff, and it was just um, not really his cup of tea. And then um, I had been doing some freelance on this side for a while since I was out of school. And uh, so I, I am a graphic designer, and that's kind of my background, a lot of branding work and um, in design. And we basically jumped in full, uh, like he quit his job and I had I'd already quit a while back to stay home with babies. And um, so we were both doing this at the same time. And um, we started out kind of freelance and then we decided, okay, we wanna start making um, the recurring monthly income. So we're going to add people and add services and kind of start building up an agency. And so for like the last, all of 2017, we were, we were saying like we're an agency. We do content development and, and that kind of thing and sell our services that way. And just this last year, we kind of realized, okay, we've, um, we've made a lot of mistakes we don't necessarily know how to sell our services, and adding people is just kind of adding to the chaos. And so we've actually cut back, and we're now um, kind of moving back to the freelance side of things um, in a more smart way, maybe. Uh, we've learned from a lot of our mistakes. We're learning how to sell our services. We're learning what like actually appeals to our clients and what's helpful for our clients. And instead of just kind of not knowing what we're doing, we're working on building up our business with the two of us and making sure that we know um, how to grow our business without, uh, you know, without just adding people, adding services, adding time, sold. So. Um, that's what's been going on these last three years, and I'm hoping to um, kind of share some of our mistakes with you today so that you can learn from them instead of um, doing them yourself. And um, so that's kind of the last three years, and I'll, I'll tell you, there's, um, there's four things before you jump into freelance. And I, um, I was asking a little while ago, um, you. You do freelance in the back, and then who else has done freelance? Kimberly, um, and you've done freelance. But everyone else, is that is freelance a goal for you? Is that something that you are interested in doing once you learn what you're doing? Okay, yeah. Um, so yeah, before you jump into that, um, there's, there's four things that you need to understand. And I will say, uh, there are a ton of resources online, like Google is your best friend when you're getting started in this. Like, so if you're looking to, you know, pricing or accounting or, um, you know, all that, all the technical stuff that gets, you know, the background of what you uh, are needing to do, Google is your best friend. You can find a lot of help online, uh, a lot of free information. Um, but there's four things that you need to understand and kind of work towards for uh, freelance if you want to be successful. And, um, and I will say, like, a lot of, the, a lot of this, like, we kind of just realized, like, okay, we don't have a good understanding of these things. How can we get that? And um, we, were pay we paid consultants to figure this out. Um, so that's always an option for you. But um, uh, some mistakes that we were making over these last three years, um, one, we were very attached. We were very up close and personal with our deliverables and the actual product that we sold. Um, we took a lot of pride in our work, which is a really good thing to have. Um, it's good to be confident in what you're doing. But um, when I say we are too attached to what we were selling, 
uh, what it, what we're doing is we kind of put value on our services that someone else doesn't see. Like it's when you're kind of up there uh, working, you're putting in the hours, uh, you don't realize like uh, what someone else is seeing, uh, what your clients actually value. It's hard to communicate to them the value of you know your time or your expertise if all you're doing is kind of, uh, if it's one-sided perspective of your work. Um, we didn't understand money when we started, uh, when we started it out. We uh, were basically just trying to make up our salary. And for freelance, there's so much more that goes into pricing your services than just making up your salary. Um, a lot of it is. Like, of course, you want to survive and you want to be able to pay your bills. Uh, but there's a lot more that goes into your cost than just the time that goes into each product or each deliverable. And so um, I'll go into that, too. And then we didn't understand value. And that's kind of the same as uh, we are too attached to the deliverables, but we didn't really understand how to um, communicate to our clients in a way that they understand and um, a way that kind of leads them to see what, why, why they need us. Um, so yeah, that's, that's like the big things. And I think that a lot of freelancers uh, don't think about, you know, how they're going to actually sell their services or how they're going to, um, you know, make up their time and make, uh, make sure that they are full, uh, have a full roster of clients. A lot of um, people just kind of jump in blindly, saying, hey, I got this cool thing. Um, and that's actually one of the things I, I love freelance for, is that anyone can do it. Anyone can jump in. Anyone uh, has the, it's very accessible to people. It's kind of a, a, a great neutralizer, because you don't have to be part of a bigger company. Um, you don't have to be dependent on you know, them just kind of feeding you like the scraps. <laughs> um, you actually get to uh, set your prices and, you know, make the money that you want to make through freelance. And um, if, if only, like, it was that easy. And it actually is easy. You just have to kind of know what those things are in order to make that money. Um, so, yeah, back to uh, the four things that you need to understand. Um, if you can detach from your product, detach from the deliverables. So um, you're putting a lot of time into making sure that you have a quality product, that you have a quality, um, that, you, that you do quality work, and you're very up close and personable, personable with that. But if you can detach from um, what you're doing each day and, and realize, you know, on an some people are too emotionally close to their product in order to have a kind of bird's eye view of it. Um, and that, that goes like for just when you're communicating with your clients, when you're um, trying to uh, price your services, and when you're doing sales, if you can detach emotionally from that product, you are going to be a better business person. Um, you can be a better, uh, you know, be more empathetic to your clients when they don't understand what's going on. And it just makes you uh, more approachable if you can come at this product as you know a little bit less uh, emotionally attached. Um, another reason you want to detach from your products is if you are, you know, building this business out. Like if you if you do end up doing freelance all the time, um, eventually you're going to want to be able to bring more people on and be able to. Uh, you know, sell sell more than just the thing that you're selling. Um, and and the way you do that is, you know, you have to kind of let other uh, developers, other other people kind of bring their craft in and they're gonna do things different than you, but it's still it's still good. Um, so if you can detach just from the product itself a little bit. Um, the other thing is money. So you need to understand money before you jump into freelance. And I will say there's uh, three stages of freelance. And basically there's the first stage where you're kind of learning freelance and learning how to work with clients, 
learning how to uh, get a uh, deliverable produced that is a quality product. And um, you're basically kind of like feeling it out. I would say that this stage is best done when, um, when you are still have a nine to five salary. Uh, not, not the way that Steven and I did it. Um, we did a lot of learning that first year, just uh, trying to figure out um, what even, like how to go back and forth with clients or you know, how many rounds of, um, what, what, with design you have to kind of do like re revisions and that kind of thing. Um, so we were just learning way too much um, without being paid full time. <laughs> and um, then there's the second stage of freelance where you are confident in the deliverable that you've produced, you've worked with clients, you can actually lead them through a project, and you are filling up your time. You are um, booking basically based on, you're, you're selling your services based on the time that you, it takes you to produce, or the deliverables that are produced with it. And then after that, uh, the third stage of freelance is you're no longer selling your services based on the time and deliverables, but the actual value that the clients are getting out of your services. And um, that's when you are able to start leveraging your time, where you actually start to uh, start making more money than the time that you are putting in. So that's kind of the third stage. And um, I will say time versus leverage. So there's also two ways of doing freelance, where you are you're actually, you have um, the time that you put in is, uh, okay, you can sell your services to a lot of clients. And if you're just trying to make up the salary that you had uh, given up, then you basically are going from one boss who gives you a salary to a lot of bosses that give you a salary. Um, those clients, st like the, the, level of expertise that you have, if you aren't um, leading them throughout the whole process, through the sales and through everything else, um, the clients actually become your boss and you aren't your own boss. Um, as Even though that uh, it's flexible, like you have the flexibility, you have, um, you know, you can set your own prices, it's still, there's this point where you know you go from having many bosses to being your own boss and actually leading the clients and um, you know showing them uh, what the value is of your services and that's where you uh, you start to sell not just the time and deliverables but the actual value and so um, and so then you can start being your expert being a consultant um, to your clients and um, I'll also say uh, pricing, like everyone gets very uh, nervous about when they go to price their services, but pricing is, uh, it's kind of, it doesn't mean anything. The actual price tag doesn't ever mean anything. Uh, the same service that you're selling for $500, someone else is selling for $10,000. Um, some, the websites that we were building for $5,000, we learned some people are selling for $30,000. Um, like, there's no, the actual price tag does not matter. Um, now, you can't, like, you can't just, like, kind of say, I'm a freelancer, I'm going to go sell my stuff for this much money. Like, there is value that um, you have to put into the product that is not based on deliverables or based on the, um, the time that you put in. The actual um, value that you're able to add is uh, is a little bit more. If you can make that results based, um, actually, we'll just move on to number three. Number three, if you can understand value of your services, um, and the value it comes when you have a, let's say you have a client, and you can see like where they're at, where they're struggling, and hit on those pain points, like. Okay, you obviously need the exact thing that I am doing here. Um, and then talk to them about like what, what is their benefit? What, um, what is, where does this service get them? Like what are their goals? 
Um, what are the emotions tied to, you know, being a little bit more free, like having um, a lot more flexibility with our website or um, being able to bring in more leads through their website or um, if you're doing apps, like what, uh, what money would they be able to bring in with those apps or what convenience um, is there? If you can point out like they're struggling now, they have a vision and they have a gap. Like so that's where your services go. Um, and it's not necessarily about the time that you put in or the deliverable, it's about you solving their problem. And if you are the one to solve their problem, then, um, then they're going to give you the money. And if they believe that you are the only one who can solve their problem, um, because you fully understand, and they will, because you fully understand what their pain points are, then they're more likely to give you what you asked for. So the price becomes um, basically what you feel is uh, worth the value to them. <clears throat> um, so about the emotional benefits to value, there are a lot of different pains that people have, like um, if you're working with business owners, then uh, a lot of their, their pain is like they can't, they have a bottleneck, they can't uh, continue to sell more or they have to, um, you know, they're, they're stressed, they're overstressed, they, uh, they don't have the systems in place that they need, um, they don't have the revenue in place, like there's a lot of pain there and it's not just business related all the time, sometimes it's, you know, they're, they're stressed, they're overworked, they, um, their employees don't respect them or, you know, there's all kinds of things that you can find out that is um, a problem. And then um, they, they are usually, they are easy, um, they have the pain and they're also making mistakes. Um, and you can tell them like what mistakes they are making. Um, you might uh, lead them to through that conversation and ask them what mistakes they are making or, um, or where they want to be instead of just um, putting up their defenses. But, uh, and then lead them to their vision. And their vision is usually something that brings them money, something that lessens their stress. And so it's the, if you can um, anchor your price to their emotions and the value to what they need, instead of what you are needing and um, the money that you need to bring in, you're going to kind of, um, it, it makes them think that you are here for them and it makes the project about their needs and not about you. So even though it's like, count, it's counterintuitive to make it all about them, but that's really all that they care about. And it also establishes trust in you um, they don't think that you're trying, you're just out there to get their money. They don't think that you're, uh, you know, they don't think that you need them as much, you know, that you don't need the sale. And that um, creates, establishes a lot of trust, and money follows trust. So um, if you can get your clients to trust you, and a lot of that is, you know, having good work and uh, having good clients in the past, but then if you can establish trust up front with clients, um, that, that like leads them to want to give you more money. And the same is also true if you are uh, doing freelance for a company, a larger company, except for their pain points are going to be different. So if you're kind of filling, um, doing coding for an agency or something like that, <coughs> then um, it's more about, you know, like, they are needing someone who's dependable. They're needing someone who can um, get the job done on their timeline. You know, they just need to know that you are going to be present, that you're going to get the job done. And that, you know, uh, their, their problem is more about impressing their boss than it is about uh, fulfilling the client's need, although some of that is there too. Um, so you just like kind of, if you can, uh, instead of selling from your perspective, if you can 
find out what their true needs are. And a lot of that is just asking them questions that matter. And, um, you know, don't be afraid to ask the questions that you need to know in order to price your services. And um, the number four thing that kind of reaches across all of everything is confidence. And if you have confidence in the service that you're providing, if you can lead your client through, um, through the whole process with confidence that you're going to get the job done. So <clears throat> what we found is um, a lot of times when we would go and uh, go into a first meeting where we're meeting and talking about um, you know, what, what we're going to do for someone before we ever get the job, is that the client themselves are not confident. Like, they don't know that we can get the job done. And people project feelings on people, onto other people. So their, them feeling not confident um, would show up. And then we would start to feel less confident about what we were offering. And it was kind of like this spiral downwards where, like, by the end, they're just like, well, I'm not sure if, the, uh, if Seed is the right people for the job because they don't know if they're the right people for the job. But um, we found when we show up with confidence that that projects back to them. And when we say, like, yes, you obviously have a need here and it's our services that are going to help you um, get the results that you want. And um, when we showed up with that confidence, then they just, like, it's kind of a peaceful feeling that they get that um, they're like, yes, this is uh, who we need. And then we could quote them the price that we want, and, like, it, it doesn't matter. Um, the actual price is anchored to the results, anchored to our confidence, and we could tell them, you know, whatever price it is, and they would say, okay, how can I make this work? <laughs> Instead of, like, no, that's too much. <laughs> so, um, if you have, and um, I will say, like, as you're starting out, if you can find confidence in one area of what you're doing, like, say you're good at um, a certain type of product, if you can kind of carry that and push your confidence to other places, um, you know, find your confidence in one area and then use it, you know, with your clients. Um, you can find your confidence here and then uh, work to, yeah, there's, there's, there's way, if you have the confidence in one place, then you can likely have, find it in another place, and you just have to find it um, and use it. And I think when, when you're starting out, when you're still in that first phase of freelance where you're learning your product and learning how to work with clients, um, you, can, you can tell them, like, hey, this is something, you know, you can work, work out with them uh, what price it needs to be, I guess. And um, if, you're, if you're getting that project done, like, you can use that project to fuel your confidence for the next, next project. So it doesn't really matter, like, what those first few projects look like as long as you're kind of, like, making sure that your goal is confidence in the product that you sell. Um, that's, that's kind of like our four things, and I'll um, open it up to questions. So uh, if, you, if you have any questions about any specific things in freelance, I'm happy to answer. He's, um, he's asking with contracts if we have um, any specific payment schedules or anything that we've learned about contracts. So um, with contracts, and I will say, like, there's, there's two parts of contracts. There is the statement of work, and that, which is we basically turn the proposal into the statement of work. And then there's a terms of service. And the terms of service is something that we, we went to a lawyer for, um, but there are terms of service online. And um, ours, is, ours is probably very specific to 
design and, and front-end web development. Um, but that statement of work outlines kind of the scope of the project, and it outlines um, the payment schedule, and really, it just kind of um, depends on what you want to get paid, but I would say get paid as much as you can up front. Um, <clears throat> we, we started out doing 50-50, and, and clients were always pretty happy with that. Now we try to do 100% up front, but we'll work with people if they need to schedule out their payments. And it, we kind of let them bring it up. <laughs> we don't, um, so if it's, uh, right now our, our package price is 5,500. It's like an eight week program where we do consulting um, for e-commerce companies. And we, uh, <clears throat> we say, hey, it's 5,500. And they say, hmm, do you, can I schedule that out? And they say, yes, what are you thinking? And then they'll say, okay, can I split it into two payments? And then, yeah, yeah, that works. Um, or sometimes they'll ask for three payments, like, yeah, that works. Um, we don't like for them, like, we're not a bank, so we don't want to be scheduling out payment plans for people. They could go to the bank, they can put it on a credit card and get payment plans that way. Um, but as far as, as far as money goes, like, you, cash flow is extremely important for freelancers, and if you are putting a lot of work into a project, where you get paid up front and then paid at the end, that cash flow like will dip um, each month and be irregular. So if you can't collect all the money that you need, then um, it's just a very unsure way of doing business, I guess. <coughs> um, we, we don't do as many contracts anymore uh, well, we don't do as many statement of works. Oh, I will say um, there is this. There is a contract online. So one thing that we've stopped doing is we've stopped listing the deliverables in our contracts because we are results focused, and we've always we've always said that we price on value, which is not true. Um, we've always pretty much just uh, price on what we need to make, and. Um, when we started pricing on the value and like the results that people get, then we were also, when we, when we were doing that and then still listing the deliverables in the contract, then people, it still looks like you're pricing based on the deliverables they get, which doesn't always make sense because, you know, we don't, I mean, until like that first few meetings, we don't even know like exactly what the client needs. And I think that's very true for scoping on code as well. Like you get into a project and you realize like, oh crap, this looked really simple, but it's not. Like <laughs> that's gonna take a few more weeks. And so if you are listing out the deliverables and not basing your price on results, then um, for one, you are probably undercutting yourself up front and um, not, not leaving room for there to be the extra time. Um, or, you know, you just, uh, yeah, it's, you're nodding your head. Are you <laughs> agreeing? Yes. Right, and that's, he was saying, um, yeah, you kind of uh, build yourself into a corner and don't allow yourself to pivot, and that's very true. That's what we were finding in our, in our contracts is we would say, oh, um, we can do this and this and this for you, and then when this and this wasn't, we would, we would do those things, and then it wouldn't provide the results, and then we, and then we would come back to the client and say, actually, um, <laughs> you, don't, you don't need this, it turns out you need this, and we've already lost that trust that um, needed to be there up front. And so you actually build a lot of, front of trust up front. If you can say, we don't know what you need. We need to, do, we need to like dive into your business and, um, and learn what you need. And then we can build out. And um, some people also do like a, a discovery package. Discovery is kind of a um, buzz, buzzword, but um, where you, know, you take two weeks 
and really dive in to what, they, um, what they're doing. They are paying for that and they can take um, your kind of prescription and go, you know, take it to someone else or they can stay on and, take, and uh, you know, have you do the work. But um, those two weeks are, it's a lot of research on your, on your part and um, it also kind of sets up your project for success so you're not like prescribing anything before you actually know about their business. Um, and so having the discovery up front and then doing all that stuff in the background. But is that, <laughs> mm -hmm. any other questions? Um, the question was, how do I, or what is my advice for someone who's working on Fiverr or some of the um, gig development sites and moving to doing their own um, work, I guess building their own business? Is that kind of what, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I'd say for one, you, you aren't completely, like you are learning how to do this. Um, if you are learning how to work with clients, then that's not a bad way to start um, because that does give you leads to begin with. Um, but to make the jump, I think you still have to understand, like, one, detach from. That's going to be really hard to detach from uh, if you're selling your services for so much little amounts of money and building those larger company businesses, selling your own services, you have to realize that, um, you know, someone is charging $50 for whatever, that someone else is charging 5000 for that same work. Like, if you can realize, like, you can get that larger amount of money and realize that, like, that's not, the Fiverr does not um, define your business, that, um, there's a lot more potential, uh, just like making the, um, being able to jump is, is kind of, like you do have that capability to jump, and so you should take it, I guess. Um, don't let like that mindset hold you back. And um, I'd say you, you still have the work, you still have the confidence that you built from that, and you can use that to um, put towards your future clients. Um, there is you also have to learn how to get those clients. And a lot of that is, you know, talking confidently about their needs and talking confidently about, like, what they're struggling with and then, um, you know, making it, like, you're the one service that you, like, the service that you provide is the answer to their problems. Uh, so kind of learning how to get clients um, through the way that you talk about your services. Uh, they don't just show up at your door. So... Did I answer? Cool. <laughs> So referral is a good way to go, especially if you have a history of clients that love you. Um, that's a, a great way to stay afloat um, and you want that so that you want kind of that base uh, if you don't have clients that have trusted you in the past then it's hard to get future clients to trust you um, but Steve and I right now are using Facebook to get clients and um, that is kind of a a very new thing, like that's a this year thing since we've um, hired this consultant, and um, it works. But basically, with any social media um, 
any profile. Like if you are talking about your service, your expertise, and kind of the pain, the, like the mistakes that people are making, um, that gets people curious. It um, it gets it gets them kind of interested in what you're saying, and then you need a way to get people to see that. And uh, what we do is we go into Facebook groups, and you know post there and. Um, we're going to be using Facebook ads. We haven't gotten there yet. We're getting a lot of great feedback without doing ads right now. Um, and so if you can, same with LinkedIn, um, if you can, you know, prime your profile, like, like this is what I do, this is my expertise, and then um, go find people that are your ideal um, customer, and then they see, like, if you... Oh, one of the things that you do have to do is like if you can pinpoint exactly what their needs are and pinpoint who your um, customer is, like just the uh, the way you can talk to them, like they automat if they can automatically say like oh this is exactly what I need, then um, you're halfway there. So, any other questions? You're not mic'd. <laughs> you might be on the side okay, for okay. the camera. Um, sorry. Um, well, I was just going to add that when we first got started, like you might not have that knowledge base to communicate with people a lot. Like I literally, we printed off business cards and I was walking around to small businesses saying, hey, I make websites. Here's, you know, so you got to do what you got to do at the beginning. Um, to kind of build up your experience. If you don't have any client work at all, you could start off, like, talk to some small nonprofits or something and just volunteer to help them out. Like, hey, I'll build you a website for free. And then you'll always have that work to refer back to. I just was making sure, like, there's kind of an intermediate step there where you kind of scramble around and learn what you're doing while you're trying to talk to people. Basically, if people know they have a problem and they know that you solve it, then um, the more people you meet that have a problem, the more you're going to find that want you to solve their problem. So um, it's, it is kind of a numbers game where if you can just meet more people who have um, problems and make it re make them realize like you can help them, um, and not it doesn't have to be like a slimy uh, sales salesy thing. Yeah. The, go ahead. Yeah, um, and your question was, if I can sum them up for the camera, um, if, yeah, if we can, it's hard to find a niche up front until we've done the work to decide. We did not know our niche up front. We actually, we worked with a SCORE mentor um, about a year and a half ago, and she advised us to niche down. And um, so that's when we started realizing, okay, well, this is the work we enjoy doing. Let's, um, let's continue to narrow it down. And we spent like a year, like actually narrowing down onto e-commerce. Um, we had just decided like cons consumer products or, um, and that kind of thing, and a lot of that was like our own expertise that kind of developed in uh, in what we liked to do, um, that helped us narrow down. But um, I will say, like, if you are able to narrow down your target, um, your ideal customer, for one, like that makes it easier for them to realize that you are the one person that can help them, 
And it also makes your work easier. Like if you're able to systemize the stuff that you do, that means that you're um, able to leverage your time and charge more um, based on their results. So you're not charging based on your deliverables and the time that you put in. Um, then, then you, like just having, being able to repeat the work that you're doing and sell it again and again, um, if there's any part of your process that you can do that for, then um, you're not starting over from scratch for each client. It doesn't take like 16 weeks to get it done. Um, it's, it's something that you can make money and, and sell. So niching down is actually a really, um, it makes it fun to be honest. I mean, it was fun to kind of explore our talents at first whenever we were learning like what we can do. Um, but now I, I get, I just enjoy being able to help more people and I can help more people if if I can sell them the same thing over and over again. So, yeah. Any other questions? If, um, how, how far have you guys gotten with your coding? Like, um, only a few people have started freelance. Uh, how many people are like doing this for full time, like coding for full time? Job. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so freelance is probably a little ways out there. I will say that um, if you are able to freelance for people and start selling your services, that's a really fast way to learn. Um, because you have like an actual real life problem in front of you. And if you can just, you know, tell your client like, hey, this is a learning process. Every, every project is different. So of course I'm going to be taking time to make sure that you get your results. Um, <laughs> that's a really great way to get started in freelance without feeling guilty or without feeling like, you're doing this client a disservice. Um, if you can just be honest up front, like, hey, every project is different for me. Um, I want to take a lot of time, make sure that you get the results that you want, and you know, maybe you give them a price that you feel is fair. But if you can just get going on that, like that's how you're going to learn qu the quickest. And there's, um, this is a really great community. Like, I'm sure Kimberly and um, a lot of other people here, even in this room, would be here to help you, um, you know, if you were to hit a, a standstill. Um, I think Techlahoma Slack is also a good place to go for answers. But like, just this real world experience of freelance is going to push you a lot farther than, you know, a nine to five job where you're doing the same thing every day. Um, having those different projects up front, like learning what niche you like, um, that's going to, that, that's a really, good first step and you know like Steven was saying all it all it takes is like you know passing out a business card it doesn't have to be fancy business card um, just meeting some people who might need some help so yeah any other questions before I huh okay yep well thank you for having me um, it's good to talk to you guys. Thanks.